Our opening words this morning are by Parker Palmer. Parker's a writer, a religious scholar, a man of deep thought. And he writes, Soon, in my patch on this planet, we mark the winter solstice. As we move through the shortest day and the longest night of the year, we also start moving toward the rising of the light. For several millennia, it's been hard for our species to resist the metaphor of that fact. But I wonder... Are we so eager to get to the light that we fail to dwell in the darkness long enough to learn what it has to teach us? As we all know, there are a lot of longest nights in life, and some of them seem impossibly long. As one who has spent months in the dark night of depression, I know how important it has been to let darkness become my teacher. The poets know this too. Theodore Rothke says, in a dark time, the eyes begin to see. Wendell Berry says, to go in the dark with a light is to know the light. To know the dark, go dark. Go without sight and find that the dark too blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. And Rilke simply says, I have faith in the night. So perhaps on this winter solstice, before we start turning toward the light, we need to spend some time embracing the darkness or letting it embrace us. There are life-given lessons to learn, even in our darkest times. Embracing the Darkness at the Winter Solstice from the blog The Druid's Garden. The period of time around the winter solstice, when the light of the sun is weak and our days are so short, is a period of difficulty for many. Darkness is something that we fear in industrialized cultures. It is something that we work to drive away through our own inventions and ingenuity. We instinctively feel the need to light up our lives every waking moment. Our houses at night become as bright as the sun the various screens projecting intense light, keeping us up and wired late into the night. Even as I'm walking down the streets of my town at night, motion sensor lights blind me as I walk past people's houses on the sidewalk. Consciously, automatically, and unconsciously, we are continually working to drive away the dark, and in the process, fighting the natural cycle of the seasons. A reason that we fear darkness, I think, is the secret fear of losing the ability to see, the hidden fear of losing our sight, either temporarily or permanently, is one that perhaps resides in each of us. Modern technology also hasn't helped our relationship with darkness. Computer monitors, phones, iPads, and so on all function on a blue wavelength, the same wavelength of the morning sun. This tricks our bodies into thinking it's early morning, even when it's late evening, reducing the production of melatonin, which allows for restful sleep. Physically, we need darkness to stay in good health. Darkness helps cue sleep, and a host of other beneficial hormones that help us regulate our sleep patterns. And sleep is one of the keys to a long life. The lack of darkness is attributed by a number of researchers to be at least one cause of the rise of depression and obesity in many industrialized nations. Finally, the holiday season and the associated frenzy that goes along with it doesn't help our relationship with the darkness at this sacred time of year. In ages past, people slept more and rested during the dark months. In temperate parts of the world, when the darkness came, was after the last of the long harvest season was finished. People would fatten up on the last of their fresh stores this time of year and enjoy each other's company, burn yule logs, and take this as a time of rest. But we are now in the throes of a massive holiday rush, buying, running, doing parties, activities, the frenzy of the holiday season each year growing in intensity. 
I'm weary just thinking about it, even as I have worked to distance myself from it. Living by the seasons and with the seasons means shifting our mindsets and practices to align more closely with nature's rhythms, and darkness is part of that cycle. Jessica Prentice has done some of the best research and writing I've seen on the importance of darkness. Her book, Full Moon Feast, describes humanity's relationship to the dark and cold months of the year beautifully and compellingly. She notes at least one African tribe that sleeps for 14 hours in the darkness and who uses that extra time for visionary and spirit work. Without this darkness, she says, we are robbed of this opportunity to engage in a deep level with our souls. I think maybe that's part of the challenge we face. A frenzied culture works hard to keep us always going, 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 doing, doing, and time for deep introspection and reflection is generally not encouraged. The darkness asks us, individually, to be with only ourselves and our own thoughts. It is this darkness where we can commune with spirit in waking dreams or in sleep, in meditation, and in visionary work. It allows us time to sort through things. It gives us space and distance from everything that surrounds us and allows us rest and quietude. And darkness serves as a negative space to complement the other spaces in our lives, the middle points as well as that of the light. We appreciate the light all the better if we are not always in it. It gives us balance and perspective. I think that a lot of us see the wheel of the year as a string of rituals and celebrations. And it certainly can be that, but it can also be more. Really, to embrace and live in that energy of the season can make a world of difference. We go from fighting against it and wanting it to be over to really living in the present moment with it. News of the Infinite by Gary Kowalski Asked if he was lonesome in his hut on Walden Pond, Henry Thoreau famously replied, How could I be lonely? Don't I live in the Milky Way? Thoreau doubtless would have been encouraged by the discovery of Kepler-22 in 2011. It's a planet just 600 light years from Earth, right in the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, but a balmy 72 Fahrenheit degrees on the surface, just right for organic chemistry to flourish. It's one of the 139 potential habitable worlds sighted since the Kepler spacecraft started looking for them in 2009. And given the size of our galaxy, there are almost certainly billions of others. Life is probably widespread in our universe, scientists now agree. Back when I was a boy, a famous experiment produced amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, by flashing an electric spark through a beaker of ammonia, methane, hydrogen, and water vapor, thought to be the primitive components of Earth's atmosphere. The theory was that, long ago, a lucky lightning strike in a shallow pond produced the first protoplasm. But now we know that amino acids are everywhere, in the tails of comets, and in the dust of interstellar space. Wherever conditions are right, evolution takes off. And conditions are right all over. Many cosmologists agree that the cosmos appear precipitously suited to life, right down to the fundamental constants that govern gravity and allow stars and planets to form at all. Of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that the universe was designed for beings like us, but it does put a new twist on old legends like the Christmas star. Does it really matter whether a nova appeared over Bethlehem all those years ago? For me, the real wonder is that we are all born out of stars, every molecule in our bodies forged in the furnaces of the heavens. What this means is that we humans belong here. 
We are not just accidental tourists in this world. We have grown out of time and space as naturally as grass pushes up through a city sidewalk. And we are linked to nature not only in our biology but in our minds and spirits also, which conceive space probes like Kepler and seem eternally fascinated by the big questions of where we come from and where we fit into the greater scheme. Who cares whether astronomers find another habitable planet anyway? It would take 22 million years for our fastest rockets to reach Kepler-22, not even figuring in for pit stops. But the answer is that people care. For beyond the business cycle, the election cycle, and other ephemeral headlines, human beings remain creatures hungry for news of the infinite. And for me at least, it's satisfying to know not only that we live in the Milky Way, But in some important sense, the Milky Way, in all its brilliance and unfathomable extent, also lives in us. Her next reading is by Jeanette Winterson. It's a suitable last name, I think, for this reading. And she's from England, and you need to know that for something to make sense at the end of the reading. It's human to want light and warmth. Our pagan ancestors had a calendar of fire, festivals, and God's first recorded words, apparently, according to the Hebrew Bible, were, let there be light. Night belongs to the dark side, literally and metaphorically. Ghosts, scary monsters, robbers, the unknown. Electricity's triumph over the night keeps us safer as well as busier. But whatever extends the day loses us the dark. We now live in a fast-moving, fully-lit world where night still happens but is optional to experience. Our 24-7 culture has phased out the night. In fact, we treat the night like failed daylight. Yet slowness and silence, the different rhythm of the night, are necessary to correct the days. I think we should stop being night resistors and learn to celebrate the changes of the seasons and realign ourselves to autumn and winter, not just turn up the heating, leave the lights on longer, and moan a lot. Night and dark are good for us. As the night lengthens, it's time to reopen the dreaming space. Have you ever spent an evening without electric light? It doesn't matter whether you're in the city or the country, as long as you can control your own little pod, Make it a weekend, get plenty of candles, and lay the fire if you have one. Prepare dinner ahead, plan a walk, so that you will be heading for home in that lovely liminal time where light and dark are hinged against each other. City or country, that sundown hour is strange and exhilarating. As ordinary spatial relations are altered, trees rear up in their own shadows, buildings bulk out, pavement stretches forward, The red wrapper of brake lights turning on a road makes a lava flow. Inside, the lights are going on. Outside, it's getting dark. You, as a dark shape in a darkening world, want to hold that intimacy just for one night. Go home. Leave the lights off. We've all experienced negative darkness, those long stretches of night when we can't sleep and worry about everything, and so we know that dark time can be interminably long compared with light time. Yet this slowing of time can be the most relaxing and beautiful experience. Spending the evening in candlelight and maybe by the fire with no TV, talking, telling stories, letting the lit-up world go by without us expands the hours and alters the thoughts and conversations we have. I've noticed when all the lights are on, people tend to talk about what they are doing, their outer lives. Sitting around candlelight or firelight, people start to talk about what they're feeling, their inner lives. They speak subjectively. They argue less. There are longer pauses. To sit alone without any electric light is curiously creative. I have my best ideas at dawn or at nightfall, but not if I switch the lights on. Then I start thinking about projects, deadlines, demands, and the shadows and shapes of the house become objects, not suggestions. Things that need to be done, not a background thought. The famous sleep on it 
When we have a dilemma we can't solve is an indication of how important dream time is to human well-being. The night allows this dream time and the heavier, thicker dark of winter gives us a chance to dream a little while while we are awake, a kind of reverie or meditation, the constellation of slowness, silence, and darkness that sits under the winter stars. I live in a wooded, deep country, so inevitably light and dark keep their natural non-city qualities for me, and I find myself responding to the changes in the light and adjusting my ways from outdoors to indoors. I read more in the winter, I write more, I think more, I sleep more. I don't plan any of this, rather I just don't resist the seduction of the darkness. I like the slowness of night. When friends from London arrive high on electric lights like hamsters on a 24-7 wheel, I slow them down by feeding them food with darkness sealed in it. Deep red venison stew, carp from the bottom of the river, root vegetables grown in rich black soil. Just as our bodies use the sun to start vitamin D for winter, so the root vegetables common to autumn and winter have used their summer foliage to lock in the sun. There's a wonderful alchemical image of black sun, dark, not radiating, outwards, but inwards. And that packed in power is what you get in the autumn root vegetables. Little red turnips, ruby beets, deep orange rounds of carrot are in themselves dark suns. I believe in pleasure, but not the same pleasure all the time. Seasonal pleasure prevents boredom and cynicism There is great pleasure to be had from coming home on a wild night when the weather is vile and pouring a glass of good red wine, cooking dark food such as mushroom risotto or braised beef served with dark green cabbage and truffle mash. And if you only have 15 minutes to cook, make it mushrooms on toast. But keep the good red wine. That kind of cooking cheers you up in winter because it's what the body needs. If you want to be depressed, spend the long winter nights eating out-of-season food. This is not the time for Caesar salads or anything with the words slim, diet, or low-calorie on the label. After a day at the office, a brisk walk home, even if it takes an hour, followed by real winter food, will give you good spirits of the kind not to be found in the overlit overheated, bust-in-the-traffic-jam situation, followed by a ready microwave meal. It's no mistake to fight the cold and the dark. We're not freezing or starving in a cave so we can enjoy what autumn and winter bring instead of trying to live in a perpetual, climate-controlled, fluorescent world, the same day in, day out, processed, packaged. I have a tiny wood-burning stove on my girlfriend's balcony in London, She thinks I'm crazy, but I like to sit in front of it with the lights of the city elsewhere, heating a pan of soup or roasting chestnuts. And yes, I could do that on her fancy falcon cooker, but I wouldn't be where I like to be in my mind, which is dark without being melancholy, brooding without being depressed. Food, fire, walks, dreams, cold sleep, slowness, time, quiet, books, seasons, all of these things, which are not really things, but moments of life, take on a different quality at nighttime, where the moon reflects the light of the sun, and we have time to reflect on what life is to us, knowing that it passes, and that every bit of it, in its changes and its differences, is the here and now of what we have. Life is too short to be all daylight. Night is not less, it's more. Aaron Fawcett writes of the time when they had a power outage. Her children were in the bathtub and her husband was working late in the office. and She managed to dress the children in the darkness before she went to find some candles. She writes, when my husband arrived home a bit later, I was telling them a story in the candlelit bedroom. My husband raised his hands and made a shadow puppet rabbit on the wall and then a bird flying across the half-lit ceiling. My children were enraptured. Do it again, Daddy, they said. 
We've all tried it, and we started out as something that was a frightening experience for my children, and it turned into a magical time when they settled down to go to sleep. The lights went on again sometime after midnight, but the evening had settled into my children's imagination, something they've talked about many times since. Do you remember when Daddy made the shadow puppets? Remember the night when Dad lit all the candles and it was so dark? When can we do that again? The event made me think about how few times we truly experience darkness in our modern lives. True darkness, like true silence. It's a rare thing. And yet I think of my children and the children inside all of us, and we hearken back to some distant ancestral memory, winter nights made magical by storytellers spinning tales in the darkness, the only lights, the stars, and the embers around a fire. There's something magical for me about such a scene, people clustered together for heat and light, rather than scattered to their various corners of the house, to their various devices and diversions and pursuits. So since that night, I've tried to think of more ways to bring this feeling into our home, while at the same time accepting and even honoring the encroaching darkness of the coming winter season. As the days shorten and we eat our dinner after dark, I like to turn out the electric lights and then light a beeswax candle at the center of our table, a single point of light in the surrounding darkness. As I light the candle, I say the following words that I learned from my son's preschool teacher. Though candlelight wanes, our flames burn bright, our candles glow in darkest night. We share a moment of silence in this circle of candlelight, and then maybe we'll talk about what we're grateful for or someone we miss and want to send a special blessing to. And I find that this interlude seems to draw us closer and bring a mood of reverence to our table and a sense of gratitude for the meal we are about to share. On some nights, we eat the entire meal by candlelight, And something about that circle of light within the surrounding blanket of darkness seems to nourish us as we face the coming season. Lately, I've also tried to honor the darkness with a special moment before bedtime, extending a ritual we followed the past years during the Advent season. I light a candle in the kitchen and lead my children by candlelight to bed. Then we use the candle to light another one in a special glass-fronted container in my daughter's room. We say our prayers or blessings by candlelight or briefly talk over the events of the day. There's something about the candlelight that seems to invite my children to voice wishes or concerns that they might otherwise find hard to share. I also find that when I finally blow out the candle, my children seem to accept the darkness and coming sleep as a friend rather than something to be feared or fought. It makes me think of another blessing I used to say for my daughter when she was a baby, a verse that I found in Shea Darian's wonderful book on family rhythms called Seven Times the Sun. It begins, The dark comes like a blanket, protecting us at night. This is a season to think of darkness as a blanket, a friend, an ally, not as something to be overcome. Our meditation words are by Rabbi Brad Hirschfield, and it's a a lesson and a teaching reflection that he gave just before the holiday of Yom Kippur. Think about the moon, the central symbol of the entire Jewish calendar. The old moon, which defines the previous month, vanishes, and a new moon appears. But is it really a new moon, or is it the same moon? The answer is yes. What's true for the moon is true for us. Just as the old moon gets a seemingly limitless number of second chances to be celebrated as the new moon, we too get limitless second chances. Jews celebrate that fact on Rosh Hashanah, the holiday of atonement. But perhaps we should all celebrate it every day. We can all add a new page to the book of our lives, one which, like the addition of a new page in any book, neither erases or undoes what came before it, but one which can transcend those earlier pages and the stories they contain. Each of us gets a second chance, a chance to return to the person we most want to be and to living the life we most deeply desire. 
That's the very human promise which lies at the heart of the Jewish New Year. As we bid farewell to the sun each day, the moon graces us with its luminous presence at night. It may change its look as proximity to the earth and sun changes, but we can count on it being there, keeping silent vigil. Here are five things we can learn from the moon. Number one, show your true face. The moon does not rotate, but instead continually shows the same face to the earth. Don't be two-faced in life. Live from the heart and show the world your true self with consistency, authenticity, and integrity. Number two, be a good influence. The moon moves the tides due to gravitational forces and keeps the earth bodies of water dynamic. It also tilts the earth's axis just enough to allow us to experience rich, varied seasonal changes throughout the year. How can you be an even better influence to the world? Number three, reflect the light. The moon shines brightly at night due to reflected light from the sun. Strive to make your own life a beacon of reflected light and positivity. Number four, wax and wane naturally. Life is about going with the flow. The moon shines with more intensity at some points in its cycles and less intense in others. Embrace the ebbs and flows of life's rhythms gracefully and naturally. Number five, inspire greatness. The moon has inspired countless songs, paintings, poems, writings, and other works of art. Strive to make your own life an inspiration to those around you. The moon illuminates the night sky so reliably, most of us tend to take it for granted. However, this lunar orb has much to teach us. Keep an eye on the sky at night. Enjoy the changing cycles of the moon and apply the wisdom of this silent, luminous teacher. Our closing words are by Reverend Paul Paluca. Though the darkness grows, go guided by the light of wisdom. Though the cold winds chill us to the bone, go surrounded by the warmth of love. Though you let go of many things, may you always have a hand to hold. As days gradually grow longer and winter's grip is eased, hold firmly to what is gained from the dark as you reach towards the light. Embrace light. Embrace dark. Embrace life. May it be so.